Welcome back, chemists. In this lesson, we are going to look at addition reactions to alkenes and a few with alkynes as well. Previously, we learned how to make alkenes from halides and alcohols, but we're going to see that they're quite useful as nucleophiles, and we can add small molecules to them. So if I just have some binary molecule XY, the alkene can attack that molecule and you get an addition where whatever X is attached to one of the carbons and Y to the other. There's a lot of consequences of that addition that are worth going into, things like stereochemical outcomes. So we'll, we'll teach ourselves a, new re a couple of new reactions in this lesson and learn those consequences. Uh, a similar reaction can be thought of for any alkyne as well. So even though I'm only going to talk about alkenes today, a lot of these reactions apply to alkynes. The key is you lose one of the pi bonds and you're left with something that's one pi bond fewer. So an alkyne becomes an alkene, and likewise an alkene can become an alkane. So let's look at a handful of reactions, starting with just addition of a halo acid. I'll say addition of HX, for example, HBr. If I react methyl cyclopentene, just as an example, with HBr, you lose the pi bond, you get a bromine on the more substituted carbon, and you actually get a hydrogen on the less substituted carbon. But I'm not going to draw that because it's a line structure. And let's see how we get this product. We're going to draw a mechanism. So why don't you redraw that methyl cyclopentene just in the space below, and we'll see how this works. So HBr I'm going to draw with the bond between. HBr is electrophilic. Remember, that means electron poor. Things will attack it. Pi bonds are nucleophilic. They're electron rich. They have an extra pair of electrons. So draw an arrow from the pi bond, the middle of the bond, to that H. And then draw another arrow showing the bromine leaving. And what that gives us is a new bond between the carbon and the H. There it is. Turns out, as a result, I no longer satisfy the octet on that tertiary carbon, and I have a carbocation. You get a carbocation intermediate, which means there's the potential for rearrangements. This one's okay, though. It's tertiary. And that leads me to why we actually get the cation on that position. Why do I get it right there as opposed to the reverse? I certainly could have drawn an H on the more substituted carbon and a plus on the less substituted carbon, but that's not what carbocations want. They want to be more stable. So as a result, the bromide, which is now floating around in solution, sees this carbocation and it forms a bond. So draw an arrow from that bromide to the plus charge, and there's your product. And this brings up a very meaningful, fundamental rule that we will see in this course called Markovnikov's Rule. Markovnikov's Rule dictates the outcome of addition reactions. And I'm going to simplify what many textbooks write the rule as and just say addition occurs via the more stable cation. Everything you know about carbocations should make that make sense. Now, the rule actually says something about the product itself, such that the H will go to the less substituted carbon and the bromine goes to the more substituted carbon. And that's what we actually see. It's very hard to trap and see intermediates. We indirectly figure out what the intermediate is by looking at the product of many different types of reactions. Mechanisms are very challenging to decipher that way. But what we're learning in this class are very well-established mechanisms, and we feel very confident in, in what we draw as a result. So we get the tertiary cation in this case. That's why I specifically chose an alkene that wasn't symmetrically substituted uh, because you get addition on that spot. So let's try a few others. Uh, right below it, this is called halogenation, which is addition of a halogen. I'm using bromine as an example. And when you react... I'm going to use the same example of an alkene. These reactions apply to any alkene, but I'm just using one molecule as an example. It happens to be cyclic and substituted on one side, so it's a nice example to show stereochemical outcomes. When you react methyl cyclopentene with bromine, you get two bromines, 
and no more pi bond, and they happen to add anti to each other on the opposite face of the ring. So let's explain this outcome again with a mechanism. Go ahead and redraw methylcyclopentene. Now bromine is a nonpolar molecule, but when an alkene sees this, it polarizes it, and the alkene will attack one of the bromines, and the other one will leave. And just like we saw up above, you get a carbocation. So here I have a bromine and a plus charge on the more substituted cation. That's still following our Kovnikov's rule in terms of what intermediate we get. Now, you might say, oh, we're, we're done. The other bromine sees this and it just forms a bond. And that's how I get two bromines. And yes, that is one way to get two bromines, but it doesn't explain the observation that this goes with anti-addition. I get anti-addition with those two bromines. And the reason for that is we've observed that there exists what's called a bromonium ion intermediate, where this positive charge is actually uh, going to form a bond with the lone pairs on the bromine that's now in the same molecule. So draw an arrow from the bromine, which remember has three sets of lone pairs around it, to the plus charge. And you get a little three-membered ring with a bromine in the ring. And this is called a bromonium ion. Just meaning a positively charged bromine. And you'll notice I gave it some direction. Now, it's arbitrary where this bromine was pointing in the beginning. I'm going to say that it was pointing out of the screen. And then when it forms this three-membered ring, it has to form that bond on the same face of the cyclopentane that we started with. So that blocks the, the back side of this ring. Uh, wait, couldn't it be behind the screen? Yes, and I'm going to indicate that by putting the little racemic symbol plus minus next to both of these chiral intermediates. So both are possible. But when the other bromide sees this, it's going to attack that three-membered bromonium ion from the opposite face of where those two bold lines are coming out at you. And it's going to go to the more substituted side because that's the carbon that feels like it's positively charged. I can't tell in this example. It just goes to the other carbon, but that will open up that ring. So I draw another arrow that shows that carbon-bromine bond breaking. Yes, the one that just formed. And it puts the electrons back on the bromine. And what you get is a five-membered ring with that first new bromine coming out toward you on that methylene, and then a new second bromine in the opposite direction. Now, that's our product, but what about this business of it being racemic? Well, you also get the enantiomer. So just for completeness, I'll show the enantiomer in this example. It's still anti. There's no diastereomer that's formed here, so it's stereoselective for anti-addition, and it's because of that bromonium ion that we have that. And it turns out that's not the only reaction that involves anti-addition. The next one, which is called halohydrin formation, has the same feature. So this is the same reaction. It's a cyclopentene with bromine, but now I'm going to use uh, an excess of water as a solvent. And what you get, I'll show you the product, and then let's see if you can figure out the mechanism for this. You get the addition of a bromine right where you think it's going to go, same as the example up above. And then you do get anti-addition, but you don't get a second bromine. You actually get an OH group. And when you have an OH on one carbon, and a bromine on the adjacent carbon that's called a vicinal carbon, it's in the same vicinity, uh, that's called a halohydrin. That's why we call this halohydrin addition. This is still anti-addition. And much of this has features that are similar to the previous example. So I'd like you to hit pause and see if you can figure out what the curved arrows would look like for this. Okay, let's see how you did. So let's redraw methylcyclopentene. First step, it reacts with bromine, just like it did above. So draw an arrow from the pi bond to the bromine. The other bromine leaves. 
get a positive charge on the more substituted carbon. I'm going to arbitrarily make that bromine coming out of the page, but you know that it's racemic. Both are possible. And you get a bromonium ion. So draw an arrow from the bromine that's now attached to the plus charge. You get the exact same intermediate plus charge on the bromine. Makes sense why that's forming. I satisfy the octet on every atom now. Carbocations are not satisfying the octet. That intermediate with the bromium, bromonium, that is satisfying the octet. Now, instead of a bromide seeing this, normally up above, I would have a Br- minus attacking this and opening it up, but we are swimming in water. That's the solvent, and sometimes the solvent can act as the reactant, as we saw with SN1 reactions in solvolysis. So draw an arrow from the water's oxygen to the more substituted carbon, the one that feels like it's positively charged, and draw another arrow from the carbon-bromine bond to that positively charged bromine. And as a result, you get a new carbon-oxygen bond with an alcohol attached to that more substituted carbon. The plus charge is no longer in the bromine, it's now on the oxygen, and we're one step away from the final product. We just have to get that H off of the water molecule, so this will look like SN1 chemistry. The water can take away that extra oxygen, and that's your halo hydrogen. And this is only one enantiomer, you will get both. You'll get the racemic mix, and that's true at every one of these intermediates once we made that chiral carbon. Okay, so all three of those examples have similar features in that the pi bond is acting as a nucleophile, attacking something that's electrophilic in each case. We're forming intermediates that go via the more substituted, more stable carbocation, uh, and then we can use this bromonium to explain the anti-addition in the second two. The last two reactions I'll show you before we move on to alkynes are slightly different in their mechanism, but they're still addition reactions, so I'm including them in this lesson. Uh, the next one is called hydrogenation. This is very useful in the food industry for making what are called hydrogenated fats and oils. Many naturally occurring fats and oils have long, unsaturated carbon chains in them, and you can hydrogenate them to drastically change their properties, their flavor profiles, etc. And how that works is you take a pi bond, you react it with hydrogen, and a catalyst. This is actually a catalyst, PD. Uh, and you get an alkane out of this. Uh, now this occurs, I can't tell in this example, but this occurs with syn addition. The two hydrogens add to the same face of the alkene, as opposed to the anti-addition we saw in the other examples. These add to the same face, and I'll show you a little bit about why. Let's redraw not the cyclopentene, but the hydrogen molecule. The hydrogen molecule first undergoes an oxidative addition with the palladium, and it binds to the, the metal surface of whatever your palladium catalyst is. This is called an oxidative addition. This is a little bit of inorganic chemistry, slightly beyond the scope of this, and we could fudge some arrows for this, and, and I'll do that. It essentially involves electrons from the palladium forming a bond with the hydrogen and then the hydride simultaneously forms a bond with the palladium, and that's how you get to that. Um, this then undergoes an olefin insertion uh, with the, the olefin, aka the alkene, which looks like that. And I'm also gonna draw curved arrows for this. What happens is the, the palladium bonds with the, more, uh, the less substituted carbon, and the pi bond picks up the H. Actually, the palladium hydride bond is what really forms that bond, so it looks more like that. And what you get is syn addition of the hydrogen and this palladium complex, which still has the other hydrogen on it. And then this undergoes what's called a reductive elimination, and you, you lose that palladium. It actually gets regenerated as a palladium catalyst. Remember, catalysts are not consumed in the overall reaction, but it's the alkene insertion step that shows that we have syn addition of the hydrogens and regenerates the palladium. 
So a very different mechanism and frankly not one that I would ever ask you to reproduce. In fact, that's not even a complete picture of what's going on there, but it's trying to make it relevant to, to what we see. The last one, the last addition that we're going to look at is called cyclopropanation. This one's really specific. But it's a pretty useful reaction if you want to make a cyclopropane, as the name suggests. So if I take methyl cyclopentene, treat it with diiodomethane and an amalgam of zinc and copper, you get a new three-membered ring where the pi bond was. I've only added one carbon to that. All the other carbons were there. And this does occur with syn addition, which I'll draw like so. So half of these reactions today were anti, half of them were syn, and it's always the mechanism that explains why what we see is what we see. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about the mechanism. Diiodomethane looks like that. It's the zinc that chemically does an oxidative addition, kind of like a palladium did with the hydrogen molecule. I'm not going to draw the arrows for it. I will simply show how the zinc inserts between the carbon and the iodine. And this forms something very unique. You, you lose zinc iodide minus zinc iodide, and you get an intermediate that looks like this, which is a CH2 group and a lone pair. That's called a carbene. That is a neutral species, no formal charge on the carbon. But it should look very strange because there's only two bonds on the carbon. But you can see why there's no formal charge. There's one lone pair and two bonded hydrogens. In other words, it's just this part. It's just the CH2 group after losing the zinc and the two iodines. Carbenes are very interesting. They're simultaneously nucleophilic and electrophilic at the same time. So when this thing sees an alkene, which we are learning is a nucleophile, the alkene attacks the carbene carbon. And at the same time, the carbene carbon attacks the alkene. And that's how all in one step, you get your new three-membered ring. And it's that addition which occurs all at once to give you your, your syn addition product. Okay, so let's just finish up by looking at some alkyne reactions. There's actually not much to write with this. I'm just gonna teach you that how do alkynes react in these reactions? Well, the answer is, for the most part, they do the same kind of thing. So the difference is that you have two pi bonds in an alkyne as opposed to just one in an alkene. So many of these additions happen twice. You get over addition. It's often quite hard to stop halfway and only react one of the pi bonds. For example, if I use hydrogen and palladium with an alkyne, you'll attach two equivalents of uh, hydrogen you'll get H on each carbon, and then H on each carbon again. In fact, I'll draw that on this, just so you can see where they ended up and the two carbons that used to have no hydrogens on them, uh, which, oh, whoops, actually it's not those, is it? It's actually those two. There we go, those are the hydrogens. Um, and that just brings us to, is there a way we can stop this? Well, for hydrogenation, yes, there is. There are two very special reactions that we will use a lot. One is a special type of hydrogenation with what's called Lindler's Catalyst. This is just a less active version of palladiums, of typical palladium catalysts, and it stops at the cis alkene. So you get the, the Z alkene with a Lindler reduction. And then there's a very different mechanism for the reaction that stops at the E, or trans alkene. This one is actually radical based. And you saw it without realizing it back in the days of radical chemistry, because that's a radical donor right there, the sodium atom. So bottom line, most alkynes will undergo multiple additions for these reactions. Uh, the two that are most useful are those that can specifically make a Z and an E alkene. And then the rest of these are just examples to introduce how alkenes undergo addition reactions. We will see a lot more in the coming lessons.